everybody. Uh, today I will be discussing femur fractures, elbow fractures, and interarticular block. Special thanks to Dr. Patrick, Dr. Go, Dr. Anderson, Dr. Murray. So let's start with the case. Got it. Yes. All right, you're working in the pediatric ED. An eight-year-old male presents to your emergency department, crying and pointing to his right leg. His mom said that he flipped off his bike while playing outside. You suspect the femur fracture, but you know the x-ray machines are all like the CCT trauma. Goes. So what else can you do in the meantime? So grab your ultrasound. So why ultrasound? It's a safer diagnostic alternative to x-ray CT scans. It spares children exposure to ionizing radiation. Necessary. And it's cheap and really quick and accessible in emergency departments. So we're going to discuss femur fractures first. Uh, in the images, you can see I showed an x-ray and then an ultrasound basically showing head of femur, neck of femur, and the cortical discontinuity that you're going to look for when you look at the fracture. So I'm going through one study. This was a small observational study back in 2018. Uh, basically, the authors uh, did a perspective study comparing ultrasound versus plain radiography in the detection of fractures in a pediatric patient. So these are some of the operating characteristics that they found. The sensitivity is around 96.2%. The specificity is around 100%. The authors concluded that it was a great tool to evaluate pediatric long bone fractures. Um, it has limited use in identifying metaphysial fractures, but it does detect callus formation earlier than x-rays. Um, I'll discuss callus formation in a little bit in the next slide. So this is callus formation on the ultrasound. You see where the arrows are pointing. Um, essentially, this is an ultrasound finding uh, around a fracture site to indicate the fracture is healing. Um, and it's basically saying serial ultrasound exams can be used to monitor the progress of fracture healing by looking for this finding. Sometimes patients do present to the emergency room a week to a couple of weeks after the incident saying they still continue pain there. And if you see this finding, you know that they probably had a fracture there that's currently healing. So another study uh, on Barada in 2012 is another perspective study. Um, basically, the authors were looking at the agreement between emergency physicians using emergency ultrasound and radiologists on assessments of suspected. And as you can see, for the operating, operating characteristics of the ultrasound, Sensitivity is around 95%. Uh, specificity is around 85%. You see the positive predictive values are around 83%. So the authors concluded that because of the high sensitivity and specificity of ultrasound <laughs> and the detection of long bone fractures, um, it can be used uh, for suspected long bone fractures in children. So here, uh, this is basically looking for the fracture. So you can see right here in the fracture, if you trace the bone cortex all the way down to the our x-rays, you see this gap right here, which is basically indicating so let's go through a clinical case. We have a neonate presents with irritability, excessive crying, restricted movement of the left eye after daily neonatal massage. So what is neonatal massage? So I did a little research on this. Uh, basically, it's been performed since ancient times. Um, it's supposed to help with parental bonding, decrease infant stress. Um, they did some studies where it said they actually improved weight gain for some of the neonates, improved their sleep-wake cycles, improved their feeding tolerance. Uh, so basically, they brought this, this is an actual case that I found online. Uh, so they did x-rays on the neonate uh, because the baby was crying, the baby was moving the left eye. Um, as you can see, they did x-rays, and maybe you can see something going on in the bone over here. Uh, so the doctor decided to do some ultrasound. So before we go into the ultrasound, let's review the anatomical planes quickly. So if you remember your anatomical planes, we use a lot of sagittal, frontal and transverse. So the two we're going to really be discussing is the sagittal the transverse. Sagittal basically divides the body into left and right, which are long axis views. And transverse divides the body into top and bottom halves, and short axis. So over here, I just demonstrated it showing how the blood vessels look at your transverse plane versus your longitudinal plane. So think about when you do your ultrasound guide procedure with your Okay, this is just another view of looking basically at the cuts for sagittal and transverse planes. So positioning of the ultrasound probe on femur, essentially you're getting your high frequency linear probe and you're placing it on the femur plane, basically scan throughout the bone to look at the cortex. So this is a normal neonatal femur. If you look at, this is a long axis sagittal view. And if you look at the bone cortex all the way down, uh, there's no break. This is the short axis view, transverse view of the ne normal neonatal femur. So now we're gonna look at our patient's femur. So they did the ultrasound, they found this in the cortex. So right in that area on the x-ray where you can kind of see some bowing, the ultrasound definitely picked it up very quickly. If you look at the uh, cortex, you see it's 
uh, they pull up protoplasm discontinuity, which is something you look at next year as well. And it was easily picked up on ultrasound when they did it. And this is the short axis where you can also see the same fracture of the arrow is pointing. All right, so I'll put the two images next to each other so you can kind of compare the x ray and the ultrasound and see how much clearer the uh, ultrasound showed the fracture versus the x ray in this new image. So this is another meta-analysis system, systematic review I found uh, by Chartier, some other authors back in 2017. And essentially they did a meta-analysis of several studies basically assessing test characters of ultrasound to identify long bone fractures in adults and children. So as you can see, there's a wide variety in some of the studies with sensitivities went from 64 to 100%. The specificities went from 79 to 100%. But overall, uh, the pool data, the authors concluded that Focus had pretty good diagnostic accuracy and should be used as an adjunct to plane radio. So this is a study done by some of our own famous authors here at County and Downstate. Uh, this is another systematic review I found while I was searching. And essentially, the authors uh, did a systematic review investigating the operating characteristics of emergency focus for identifying extremity fractures, history of physical exam for identifying fractures, and kind of compared 26 different studies. As you can see, the ultrasound for the upper extremity fracture operating, operating characteristics, the pool sensitivity was around 93%, and the pool specificity was around 92%. Which was and for lower extremity fractures, uh, the pool sensitivity was around 83%, the pool specificity was around 93%. So the conclusion was that basically compared with radiography, emergency focus is an accurate diagnostic test to rule in or rule out uh, extremity fracture. Um, it was shown to be the best like ankle and foot fractures, but they kind of looked at several fractures throughout the studies. And this study is a case series study, and basically they looked at the ability of ultrasonography to detect different extremity bone fractures. So you can see the overall sensitivity uh, when they looked at all the different extremity fractures was moderate because uh, they were kind of comparing missing metaphysial fractures, different fractures like that. But overall, they said the ultrasonography showed the best sensitivity detection of femur, which is around 100%, and humor issue was 76.2%. But they had really low sensitivity in the detection of intraarticular fractures. So moving on to elbow fractures. So basically in this image, I'm showing a demonstration of something that we look for, the posterior fat pad, which is a pathologic finding for cult superconical fractures. And over here, we're gonna discuss these findings. This is the ultrasound finding showing this thing. So we have a clinical case. We have a 16-year-old male present with right elbow pain and swelling after he fell off his skateboard from pollution injury. So these are the x-ray images that you got. So if you take a quick look and look here, it might be like a small, there's a posterior fat pad, the cell sign that you look for. So looking at one of the studies that was a prospective study back in 2016, uh, the authors are basically investigating the utility of focus for identification of pediatric elbow fractures. Uh, so among 21 patients that they uh, investigated, normal ultrasound, no fracture was diagnosed later. Uh, they said the posterior fat pad on ultrasound had a sensitivity of 100% for elbow fractures. And lipohemarthrosis on ultrasound had a sensitivity of 92% for elbow So the authors concluded that you can use ultrasonography, and it's pretty sensitive in terms of detecting occult elbow fractures in children. And they said when the radiography and ultrasound are both normal, the possibility of fracture can be ruled out definitively. So this is a long axis for the short axis placement for elbow ultrasound. So remember, in the long axis, right, our two views that we're speaking about, again, your probe mark is going to be facing up towards the patient's head. And your short axis view, you're going to rotate it towards uh, the right. So let's take a look at our patient. So I put two different ultrasounds, one normal and one abnormal, so you can look at the elbow with the, with the longitudinal point. So if you look here, you can see the olecranon, your tricep tendon, the tricep muscle, and the fat pattern should not be elevated. But in our patient, in this position, the longitudinal axis, you see here that you have an elevated fat pad and you also have a joint diffusion. This is demonstrating here the triceps with the fat pad and the joint diffusion, the olecranon bone, and the humerus bone. And this is an indication of the elbow fracture. So here's your elbow ultrasound, the short axis view. You always want to make sure that you look at the, both elbows and look at the normal elbow and the abnormal elbow so you can compare the two. And you want to look at it in multiple views and fan through it so you can catch any occult findings on ultrasound. So ultrasound tip, scan the unaffected extremity for comparison. 
Like all the ultrasound data is always going to have to visualize all the anatomical structures. So here's an ultrasound olecranon process, which should be done as well when you're taking a look at the elbow. And here's an ultrasound of the radial head. On the longitudinal axis, they say you should always pan through to take a look at the elbow. They say you can have the patient supinate or pronate slowly to help interrogate the radial head a lot better. Here's an upper ultrasound of the radial head in the short axis view. And you can do the same movements in a transverse view so you can take a look and investigate the radial head of patients. So clinical case conclusion, you quickly identify a joint effusion and posterior fat pad and ultrasound for your patient's right elbow. You call the orthopedist who rushes down because of your finding. And they send a patient for an x-ray so they can look for angulation. But a patient is a destruction of the arm. So this is another perspective study that I found. Uh, basically comparing a bedside point of care ultrasound and CT and elbow injuries. And essentially they look at some of the operating characteristics. The sensitivity for ultrasound is about 97%, specificity is 88%. They said focus was shown to be successfully applied in diagnosis and measurement of elbow injuries, uh, in which direct radiography was inefficient and CT scans were required. So, so when x-rays couldn't pick it up, the ultrasound saw it, and it was later verified at CAT scans, essentially. And there's another image comparing your normal versus abnormal findings for your, your elbow ultrasound. So conclusions from the literature. So say we get unnecessary radiation. When you have a negative x-ray and ultrasound, uh, in some of the literature, they say you can essentially rule out an elbow fracture. Uh, but you have to be careful with some of the femur fractures. Uh, the evidence was not as good for metaphysial fractures and intraarticular fractures. But do the ultrasound. It's sensitive, reliable, and quick. So right now, we're going to go through a procedure the so ultrasound guided intraarticular block for shoulder dislocation. So why not just give IV analgesics and IV benzos? Let's look at some of the literature. Uh, in one study, uh, authors in 2009 basically did a review and meta-analysis of the literature. And essentially, uh, through all the evidence, they concluded that intraarticular lidocaine is a good alternative to procedural sedation and management of anterior shoulder dislocations. So in this updated meta-analysis in 2014, the study concluded that Intraarticular lidocaine had lower complication risks, uh, including respiratory depression, vomiting, thrombophlebitis, shorter length of stay. And they did find that they said intraarticular lidocaine had longer time to reduction, but in the study, they didn't really take into account for procedural sedation, setting up procedural sedation, and sensing the patient, having the nurses set everything. In this study right here, they compared intraarticular lidocaine to IV meperidine and diazepam in a randomized clinical trial. And they concluded that basically intraarticular lidocaine was not inferior to IV pain meds and benzos for pain control. And patients also had shorter length of stay and less adverse events. They did another randomized control basically comparing IV lidocaine to IV analgesia. And they concluded that the immediate success rate of reduction, pain during reduction, and post reduction pain relief had no significant differences. So they basically concluded that. IV lidocaine may be less expensive, may be associated with fewer adverse effects and a shorter recovery time for your patients in your procedure. So why ultrasound? And I found this one meta-analysis basically uh, looking at uh, shoulder girdle injections. They did several different injections, including the glenoid humeral injection in cadavers. And they basically concluded that for shoulder girdle injections that the joint injection accuracy was around 92.5% for ultrasound approach versus 72.5% for the landmark. P body is 0.025. So, conclusions from the literature intraarticular lidocaine has better side effect profile, results in shorter overall hospital stay than IV. Benzos and pain meds, pain reduction was similar between the two groups, and using the ultrasound guided technique is more accurate and effective than landmark based injections. So, first, you have to identify your landmarks before you do the injection. Uh, identifying shoulder dislocation on ultrasound is something that you can do as well. So, this is an intact right shoulder, you can look for the humeral head. You can look at the blood arm. It should interface like this. Then shoulder dislocations, parashoulder and anterior dislocation, you notice that the humerus is further down your ultrasound, and posterior, posterior dislocation decreases further up. So approach to the intraguided guided, guided intraarticular injection. So basically you need several materials. Uh, you want your high frequency linear probe as we use for the other studies. Uh, you, you want a sterile ultrasound probe and gel, sterile gloves, skin disinfectant. Uh, and then you can choose which numbing medication you're going to use. But remember to calculate your toxic doses. This is the position that you have for ultrasound placement. 
Uh, remember, you want to have the pro marker pointed towards the glenoid, uh, so you can have that. And remember, we did the attack right shoulder, you the glenoid towards the pro marker side, the lateral side, the humeral head. So this, you want basically in-place placement of the ultrasound probe and needle. So you can follow your needle tip all the way into the joint space. Identify your landmarks, look for the glenoid, look for the humeral head. You want to go right in between those two when you're doing your intraarticular. There's an in-plane view of the needle tip approaching the glenoid humeral space. Remember, if you're in-plane and uh, you're going into ultrasound, you should follow your needle tip all the way to the joint space before you start to check. So some of the contraindications to the intraarticular uh, If they have allergy to the anesthetic, if it's an altered or unconscious patient, if there is an overlying infection in the area, or if they have a neurological deficit in the infected patient. Remember the potential complications, accidental puncture, injection into the suprascapular or the circumflex scapular and the vascular structures. Uh, you can introduce uh, theoretically infection into the area. You can also have local anesthetic systemic disease. So summary overall, ultrasound is effective for identifying long ball fractures or called elbow fractures, shoulder dislocations. Consider using ultrasound equivocal x-rays in patients with suspected fractures, as it may prevent advanced imaging with CT, especially in elbow fractures, mid shaft fever fractures. Consider using ultrasound guided intraarticular lidocaine for shoulder dislocations. It's been shown to be safer, result with less side effects, and it has a statistically significant shorter hospital stay to either name Jesus and Kansas. So I looked at some other studies, uh, basically looking at the, the risk of infection for the intraarticular lidocaine, since that's really a thought. Um, and one of the uh, meta analyses I saw, they basically looked through six RCTs, and they found no um, infection after mm -hmm. all the injections. They said it's a theoretical risk, and obviously you should. We start to be and clean appropriately, but they didn't find anything. I was looking through more of the literature, and there's not a lot that comes up in terms of the infection risk for uh, certain sorts of glenoid finding. Okay, any questions at all? This is sources for reading. Thank you very much. I actually did have. Oh, go ahead. Someone on Zoom. Okay. All right. Thanks, mm -hmm. Ricky. Right. Yeah. Well, I, so, I had I two questions. Mm -hmm. One is for. Um, okay, fine. <laughs> <laughs> for, for the ultrasound guided approach to uh, the joint injection, yes. It, is is there a study comparing like landmark based versus ultrasound guided and the success rates? Uh, yeah. So the study that I had here, basically, the authors looked at this cadaver okay. injections. It was like a systematic review. Get this review right here, like in 2015. And they basically, they looked at a lot of different sh shoulder girdle injections, and they were essentially comparing the ultrasound to the landmark mace. And then for the glenohumeral joint injection accuracy, they said it was like 92.5% on first attempt versus 72.5% uh, landmark approach. We can let you have a second. Okay. Uh, well, I guess the, the other question was for, for elbow pressure. Uh, elbow fractures. Are these, um, like, uh, are those ultrasound trained? Are those, like, fellows who are doing the ultrasounds? Or who's doing the ultrasounds? So some of the studies are, like, residents. Some of them have ultrasound trained people. But I think some of them, they just did uh, a couple of training, like, right before. Like, really short ultrasound training to identify joint effusion. Um, and in all those studies, they were able to find a joint effusion. Nice. That's pretty the poster of that is so simple. It, it's actually it's very, the kids are you holding their arms. Right, like hurting, and you sit right here, really pretty. And I would say there's like ultrasound guided injections here. I don't know who was doing the injections, the landmark person, because I would, I would argue you guys don't do a lot of landmarks, and actually, you're probably like, much better with ultrasound guided, and that's kind of my that get a better analysis. Fractures, I mean, fractures can be a little difficult to see, and especially with kids that would be careful, like, you really should. Both side trades, they broke late. So I would care for the size, um, fracture, make sure you're not. Just, just to highlight, like a couple of uses that we had last, last couple of weeks, um, one of the cases I like, they called me over to Pete's. Um, we used to go with someone who came in. It wasn't a clear cut uh, nurse base, it was a two year old who you know, came in, they really moved the arm, and then the resident tried reducing it. 
the equipment and these sorts of assessments. But the fellow tried, and it might be moving a little bit more, so probably reaching for the ice and it. Uh, but the attending after all that assessment, like, wait, I'm just not quite convinced. Like, you know, I got the x ray, x ray, well, maybe, maybe some more close to your back, maybe not. It's poorly clinically, I hope they are. So then they grab me and come over to do the sono, and after that, they put it on, and you can see there's a very clear post your back. And so taking that information back to that uh, very young resident, they updated their B to, oh, yeah, definitely post your back. Uh, it's probably the worth out to now cast a kid who'd already been through about 10 different production attempts before we dealt with there. So you can kind of, you know, we could redo that case in your mind, just like an M&M, and we could say, okay, we'll do a sono the kid at the beginning. Do you just like pick out those key cases that don't quite fit clinically? Hey, at the, at the jungle bars, they're pulling. All right, let's just take evidence uh, or just, just like target the kids who don't have that clear story. Maybe I'll sign them quick before we start doing this intervention. Yeah. Maybe so you can kind of like just think of like the sound is like a backup weapon. If your if your plan approach is to lead with X-ray, that's fine. Like, the knowledge in the back of your head, how can I use ultrasound? If things aren't quite lining up. They can join. They should. Uh, the other one, going back to your shoulder one, again, just on sauna rounds last couple of weeks, you know, the CCT, because you know, they sedated someone heavily for shoulder reduction, or disease, and they were yanking on it. Maybe there's a click, maybe there wasn't a click, they weren't quite sure. They're yanking on the other 20 minutes of the second round of catching. And like in your mind, you're constructing either all the side effects, all the potential complications from all the sedation. And so we're on teaching round, the sauna on it, you're already back in place. Done. Like you, you guys are, like you've been playing on this for 15 minutes. You know, like, you know, just, it's, it's kind of, Good to think of these as weapons you can use in that situation, even if you don't want to leave it. Uh, as a, just those cases. Yeah, that's a good point, I guess. Like, instead of having to repeat imaging, the song was just right. Yeah, yeah. 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 it's good for the shoulder. Yeah. I've actually had people who felt after they got a good block, yeah. they didn't walk away and the teenagers lift up. Like, it worked. <laughs> and I would also let them yell, you know, they actually are really like, happy to hear that sign. You know, that makes sense. I mean, the research shows it's, it's more sensitive. Need. So if we're asking them to adjust their x-ray read, of course, somebody has a sensitive task. Uh, I actually had a question. So for those like uh, x-ray negative, but like ultrasound positive x uh, fractures, those are primarily better for, you said, mid shaft and... Uh, okay, so that's where like the evidence is more so... Okay. Are, are harder. Okay. Perfect. All right. All right. Thank you, Dr. Thank you.